Hello everyone! I'm here to ask the age-old question. Are any of the Ice Age movies actually good? I'm sure you've all heard of Ice Age, a rather infamous film series created by Blue Sky Studios, one of, if not the most confusing animation companies of all time. You see, you have your Disneys and your Pixars and you know, you know the type of quality you're going to get from them. You see a company like Aardman, you know it's going to be great. You see a company like Illumination, you know it's going to be not as great. But Blue Sky have the most bumpiest and up and down careers I've ever seen. They were probably most famous for Ice Age, but other films they made were Rio and its sequels, Robots, Horton Hears a Who, one of the only decently adapted Dr. Seuss things ever in my opinion. Like, I, I don't care if you grew up on it. The Grinch who steals Christmas is shit. The Illumination Grinch is shit. The Cat in the Hat is horrific. And the Lor- The Lorax? Wow. Fucking hell, I got sidetracked. They also produced the Charlie Brown movie and Epic, what like my fucking mortal enemy. If you're an OG of a channel, you'll know that reference. Not to mention all of the other films I couldn't even be asked to read out because of that shit, like Spies in Disguise and Ferdinand. And with all that said, I think it's safe to say that Ice Age is a perfect encapsulation of Blue Sky as a studio. Because if you've never seen Ice Age, then you have no idea how weird these films can get. Seems to that all you see is violence in movies and sex on TV. And no, I'm not going to do this stupid cliche thing that YouTubers love to do where it's like, Did you know that there are five Ice Age movies? Uh, again, sidetracked. If this is the first time of you watching a video of mine you're, you're gonna get a quick image of how my brain works so before i get sidetracked again let's get into the real meat of the video i hope you enjoy now despite me making fun of it earlier five films is nothing to scoff at i mean i might just be being stupid here but i can't think of any animated film that's had four consecutive sequels other than ice age what well, started out as a simple story of our three protagonists teaming up together to return a lost boy to his parents devolved into stories of dinosaurs aliens and fucking pirates and this is honestly quite natural what you find with many not that great animated films that get commissioned for a lot of sequels is that the first film is usually pretty decent because the film studio actually put a lot of time and effort into the concept but then when they realize they don't have to try because of how successful that film gets they just go batshit insane and do whatever they want. It doesn't fucking matter. Anything goes. So the only reasonable thing to do is to go through each and see if any of these five films are actually any good. Let's get into it. So the first Ice Age film starts with something that's going to be ironically increasingly rare in these films. The Ice Age. We see all of these animals migrating south because of the oncoming Ice Age. Where we're introduced to Manny, the mammoth, who is heading the opposite way for some reason. And Sid whose family left him to migrate before he woke up. The only thing of interest here to note is that this creature literally shits on the floor and Sid steps in it, but like he actually shits on the floor. Like I thought this would lead to some bizarre joke about it being mud and Sid thought it would, no, it's just, he shat on the floor and now Sid has stepped in it. Uh, it's a very bizarre joke. This then leads Sid to step on these big guys food with his shit feet, causing him to hide behind Manny who happened to be there for protection. After Manny fights them off, they both fall down this hill and Manny continues his journey with Sid following him for protection. We're also introduced to Diego and his pack of mates who are trying to eat this tribal leader's baby after it's revealed that he killed most of their pack. They attack the village, but the mother and the baby get away down a waterfall. Manny and Sid end up finding the mother who gives them her baby to protect in an oddly, incredibly somber way. Like... I'm not even kidding. I did not expect this from an Ice Age film. They end up running into Diego, who tries to trick them into giving the baby over. They don't do it for obvious reasons. And Manny helps Sid return it as long as he leaves him alone afterwards. Diego ends up coming along after Manny realizes that he can help them track the humans, even though he's still suspicious of him. And another thing I never thought I'd say is Sid is really funny in this film, whether it was intentional or not. They haven't developed him into this loud, screaming, obnoxious character yet. So I remember there were many points about this film where I was genuinely found myself laughing at his jokes. Another thing that I unexpectedly liked was the dynamic between all three of our main characters when it comes to the baby. The fact that none of them can actually take care of it properly is really entertaining. Something else that surprised me for a good chunk of this film as well is that Manny is just a dick. Like, he's just an actual dickhead. He constantly berates and threatens to beat up everyone around him. And at first, he wants just to leave the baby to die. He does not want to take care of the baby. It's Sid who convinces him to save it. 
We then see that Diego is actually planning on leading the gang into a trap, as Manny would be perfect for the entire pack to eat. More hijinks ensue, and we get an actual really nice montage of the gang as they travel along. And of course, because it's the 2000s, we have to make sure that it's got Send Me On My Way set to it. It's obvious the filmmakers had no clue what to put here, so they just said, let's do a montage, but I don't mind it. It shows the gang slowly bonding together and Diego having to cover up the fact that the tigers are on their way to eat them. It's alright. More fun shit happens and then it, we get a really good scene that reveals Manny's past. And it's so dark. Like, it's revealed that Manny's first wife and child were killed by humans. This then causes him to care for the child even more as he reminds him of his own son. Now this film was not my favourite out of the bunch when I was younger, but fuck me, I don't remember any of this. Uh, more bonding happens between Diego and Manny as he saves him from a lava pit and the trio sits around a fire pit for some more wholesome scenes. The only point of these scenes is to make Diego regret his decision of betraying them, but they're still nice nonetheless. Diego decides not to betray them and tell them his original plan and how to stop the tigers from eating them. And there's no forced breakup. Oh my god. What? Oh my god, what the fuck? This is unprecedented. A children's film where a character is keeping a secret from the other characters and then reveals it and there's 20 minutes left of the movie and the characters don't split up because they're angry at one another. So they devise a plan to distract the tigers with a fake baby and then fight them on fair ground. They end up winning, of course, with the leader of the pack dying in a really fucking gruesome way. Like, what is this film? And that's that. They give the baby back to the humans, which on a really weird note, never actually say anything throughout the film, which... I kind of like it. I, I think it. I think it's a cool choice, definitely. And then Diego, Manny, and Sid head off into the distance. So that was Ice Age One. It was good. It's weird. This film was definitely my least favorite out of the bunch when I was growing up. Yet I really did enjoy it. It wasn't made particularly well. There was a lot of filler and weird parts added in that I didn't even bother talking about. But as a standard kids' film, I think it was pretty decent. Definitely a six or seven out of ten just just above average i'd recommend it the characters are well established at this point and have been flanderized to shit like i assume they will be later on the villains weren't anything to talk about really incredibly one-dimensional i honestly can't even remember their names but to be fair they're not a large part of the movie so i guess it doesn't matter too much so yeah ice age one good start so now we move on to Ice Age 2 Meltdown. I remember a lot more about this film than the first, and I remember liking it too, so I really hope that it's as good as I remember. Let's get into it. Oh, fucking hell. I'm eight minutes in and I already, I already don't like it. I can't quite put my finger on it yet, but I just don't like it. Whether it's the main cast now clearly showing signs of the Flander, or if it's the more cartoony animation and the character designs, or if it's even just all the pop culture references and the quick fucking fast zoomy editing i don't know it just feels off so the film starts off in this child daycare place that sid had opened he's mocked relentlessly by everyone there including by manny and diego which causes him to want to prove himself meanwhile manny's becoming a bit soft in this film i don't know if the filmmakers wanted to make him more child friendly but this smug ass auntie just brings up for no reason that he might be the last of his kind in a kind of mocking tone, and the most Manny can say is, Ah, your breath smells like ants. Like, in the first one, he threatens to beat the fuck out of a guy in front of his wife and kids after the guy just goes, Look where you're going. I, I, I miss violent Manny. This is where my problems start. Sid decides to go down the eviscerator in order to prove himself that he should be taken seriously. First of all, this is fucking ridiculous. Like, I know this is a cartoon, but... There's just a random slide in a kid's playground that we're told that anyone who's gone down it has died. It's just, it's so just cartoony. I, I, know, I know that sounds stupid. It is a cartoon. But cartoons need to have established rules in order for you to care about them. 
This is Ice Age, not fucking Looney Tunes. And also, if we're really nitpicking, how the fuck did Sid get up there? Manny and Diego go, go up there too to save him before he jumps, but then they zoom out later and there's not a single thing they could have used to climb on, so how did they actually get up there? So anyway, they see that the ice is in fact melting. The ice age is coming to an end, something that they didn't believe up until this point, so they go to warn everybody else. And no one listens to him? What the fuck? So earlier in this scene, when Manny was talking to the smug anteater from before, the thing that started the whole conversation in the first place was all the animals were worrying that there's going to be a big flood. In which Manny, not believing in a flood, said no, there will in fact not be a flood. Then after going up and seeing the flood, comes back down and says, yes, I was wrong. There will in fact be a flood. In which all the animals start laughing at him and say why should we believe you you said there wouldn't be a flood this right here is one of the most mind-boggling brain fucking numbing scenes i think i've ever seen in my life this scene may have worked out if the animals in the beginning didn't already believe in the flood but they did so now, why do you start laughing at Manny when he tells them, yes, in fact, there is a flood. I have seen it with my own two fucking mammoth eyes. And the sentence, you said there isn't a flood, so why should we listen to you? is one of the most backward things I've ever heard in my life. You said there isn't a flood means you listen to him you fucking dickhead that entire sentence boils down to everything that's wrong with this film jesus we're 10 minutes in and if this film doesn't love fucking contradicting itself enough we're then introduced to this lovely vulture who then tells us that it, there is in fact a flood we have confirmed it i believe there might be a flood in this fucking film and then all of the characters just believe him. So you don't believe Manny, the guy who has been with you all this time, probably helped out with this child daycare that you're all fucking using for free. I doubt Sid did any of it. You believe the random shifty vulture that's voiced by Bojack Horseman? But that's not the contradiction. The contradiction is the fact they instantly do what he wants them to do. None of them, not even the main cast, questions why this random fucking vulture is trying to help them. The vulture tells them that there's a big boat on the other end of the fucking country or whatever, like Noah's Ark, and if you get on the boat, you'll survive the big flood. The vulture says to them, if you don't make it to this boat, I will eat you. So why the fuck is he helping them? If he didn't tell them anything about the flood, surely he'd have more food to eat. It genuinely makes no sense. They never explain why these vultures, who are constantly eating people throughout this film, are helping them. We're also revealed to this film's two antagonists, these two alligator things, which to be fair, are actually quite threatening. I mean, like, they just fucking eat this guy alive. And also... Sid is becoming quite insufferable already. So the main crux of this film so far has been Manny realising he may be the only mammoth left. And fuck me, this film doesn't know the meaning of subtle. Every single second is just spent telling Manny that he's going to go extinct. And then Sid decides to just constantly remind him by singing songs about it and talking about it all the time. Like, Sid in the first film was an idiot, but he wasn't that much of an idiot, and he wouldn't do that. Another thing this film is doing quite a lot, which is, like, noticeably a lot, is toilet humour. Like, there's a scene where Manny thinks he hears another mammoth's call, so he gets all excited and goes to see what it is, and it turns out to just be this big sloth guy taking a shit, and it's the sound of his shit. Like, I'm not kidding. It... What?! It turns out, coincidentally, there is in fact a mammoth, and she's Ellie. Yeah, she's alright. Uh, apart from the fact they carry on the joke that she thinks she's a possum for way too long, she's a pretty good counterweight for Manny. The thing I can't excuse, though, is Crash and Eddie. As if this series didn't need even more obnoxious, scrawny rodents. They're Ellie's brothers, and the main reason she thinks she's a possum because she's grown up with them all her life. They also have the side plot about Diego being afraid of water, but... Who the fuck cares, honestly? 
They get attacked by the two... I don't even know what... What the f Wait, what? Let me research. They are called Kimbo Splondilus. Spon Splondilus? Kimbo Splondilus? And a Pleosaurodia. Okay, so we're going with Kimbo and Pleo. Got it? Good. They get attacked by Kimbo and Pleo, and Manny manages to fight them both off, while the rest of the cast are just useless. Which, to be fair, I don't actually mind. Kimbo and Pleo are probably the most threatening villains in this series, as they are unbeatable in the water, and you know. The whole world is turning into water. They also never speak as well, so they don't have annoying voices, and that's pretty cool. And to give this movie a small bit of credit, Ellie finds out that she's a mammoth much quicker than I expected. I thought they'd drag that shit out the entire film, but they've nipped it in the bud pretty quickly. But then Manny fucks it up two seconds later by inadvertently hitting on her and then offending her. Which, to be fair, yeah. That's a pretty shitty thing to do. Tell him that I need a little personal space right now. She said go jump in a lake and possums rule. Jesus fucking Christ, I hate them. Like, I get the dynamics of them all. Sid is stupid but fun one. Diego is the level-headed but relatively fun one. Manny is the level-headed and not fun one. Ellie is the energetic fun one. But what the fuck are Crash and Eddie supposed to be? Like, they are an amalgamation of every character trope that is just so annoying and needs to die. So then Manny and Ellie reconcile with each other in a really underwhelming way. Ellie apologizes to him for some reason about overreacting. Well, I don't think she did. Manny, after only knowing her for less than a day, is trying to convince her to fuck him. Like, not to get to know her or at this point even properly fall in love with her. He just blatantly says they need to save the species. Then another side plot comes about when Sid meets this tribe of smaller Sids, in which this famous TikTok sound came from. Thank you so much, Ice Age Meltdown. <laughs> But nothing ever comes about it, and Sid leaves acting as if nothing has happened. Brilliant. So, even more filler. I know it sounds like I'm tossing the word about a bit, but when I talk about a filler scene, I mean a scene in which has absolutely no relevance to the plot, or is even mentioned again, or has affected any of the characters in any way. So after saying that, here is a rendition of Food, Glorious Food, sung by the group of vultures. The God knows why. Like, I don't understand it. It's like, it comes out of nowhere, makes no sense that it's the only musical number in the entire film. Even in the entire series, I don't, I don't think there's another song like this in the entire series. It makes no sense because it's vultures. These fuckers only eat dead animals. And if the odd chance they're feeling a bit aggressive, they might eat a small mouse. So why is everyone running and hiding from them? The only one that should be hiding is like Crash and Eddie. And honestly, I hope the vultures get them. The gang finally get to the boat, but there are some geysers in the way. And of course, I should have guessed a forced breakup. Jesus Christ, I said. I thought you were better than this. How can the first film handle, like, a disagreement naturally and maturely, yet you can't? It doesn't even make sense. Just like any forced breakup. Ellie is scared of the geysers and wants to go back. And Manny wants to cross the geysers and go forward to the boat. But why the fuck does Ellie want to go back? She knows there's a flood and she knows she's going to die if she doesn't get across the geysers. So what does she gain from going back around and finding another route? The flood is about to come. So... As expected, Ellie goes back and gets trapped in a cave like a dumbass. And then Kimbo and Schmimblo, or whatever the fuck I called them, create a really tense final fight. Manny saves Ellie. The day is saved. They get on the fucking boat. The water just drains away somehow. I don't really understand how. And then a bunch of mammoths come out of buttfuck nowhere to create the last minute dilemma of... Does Manny and Ellie go with them, or do they stay with Sid and Diego? What do you think they picked? This one was disappointing, to say the least. I just... I don't know. I don't know what the fuck happened in it. Ellie is a character I like. She's energetic, but still a bit stubborn and reasonably level-headed. She is a good ca uh, character, especially a good love interest for Manny. But throughout the film, I don't know. Her connection with Manny just feels a bit forced. Let's take the other last of its species love story that Blue Sky apparently loved to do at this point and apply it with Rio. 
thing is with Rio is that for pretty much the entire film, Blue and Jules go through so many things that bring them closer together, so their love feels believable. For a good chunk of this film, Manny and Ellie have nothing in common because Ellie still thinks she's a possum, and even then, when she finds out that she is an opossum, like, they never have a moment together. Seriously, I've gone through the entire film, there isn't a single somber or, like, lovey-dovey scene with them. The only scene that really connects them is the one where they're fighting and Ellie apologizes on the big rock, where, like, Manny saves her. Other than that, there's no other fucking scenes in which they're together. And what what annoys me is that there's so much filler in this film. There's the whole Sid being a prophet by the mini Sids that goes nowhere, and the vulture song, and the other mini scenes that I could easily be cut out and replaced with actual character and relationship development. The jokes also just didn't land in this one. I don't know, a few of Sid's one-liners made me, like, smile, but the rest I just found weirdly annoying or weirdly out of character. Diego was fine. I think his character arc of not of being afraid of water and then not being afraid of water is handled quite well. And to be honest, the exchange at the end with Sid, where Sid reveals that Tigers actually can't swim as a child, but he didn't tell Diego that because he wanted to boost his confidence, was actually quite wholesome. Manny was all right in this film. I just miss him being a dick. He gets picked on by these ugly stuck up smug fucking animals and he just never retaliates it's just it's it's so annoying crash and idiot shit the villains are a little bit menacing but nothing more and the whole film if i'm being honest just feels like a mess i'll give it like a two out of ten not what i was expecting honestly so We've reached just below the halfway point, and my honest opinions before watching the third is that the way the trajectories these films are going to go, I don't have much hope, but I want to be pleasantly surprised. Ice Age 3, Dawn of the Dinosaurs. This one I'd say was probably my favourite out of the five. Based on the fact I remember this one the most, I'm excited to see what it's like. Astute viewers will also realise I haven't spoken about Scrat this entire video. He's probably the most well-known character in Ice Age. For those of you who don't know, Scrat is this squirrel who throughout the entire series of Ice Age tries to retrieve his nut that keeps escaping his grasp. It's like a Roadrunner cartoon type thing with all these cartoony like hijinks that happen with him. They treat him with no seriousness whatsoever. Basically any big event like the, the flood and the ice age and the continental shift and the dinosaurs and basically anything happens because he's trying to get this nut. And I hadn't mentioned him up until this point because there's very little to actually talk about. He becomes more prevalent as the films go on, especially in this film and the later on fifth film. But don't expect me to mention him too much because he's really boring. This also comes from a bit of prejudice because I just never found him funny as a child. I just thought he looked disgusting. And the body humor they do where he like pulls his fucking eye flaps about really just... It's not... It didn't work with me. So the film starts out by revealing to us that Ellie is in fact pregnant and Manny is really excited about it. To be fair, I like it. It's cute. Manny freaking out and being overprotective and excited for his child seems in character. Like, I like it. And immediately it's ruined. Like, nine minutes into the movie. Please. So, Diego is shown trying to hunt a deer and he collapses on the floor due to exhaustion. He believes that being in the herd of vegetarians has made him lose his edge and so he would like to just go on his own for a while to, re -get, like, to regain his strength and his skill. And I mean, yeah, that's valid. Fuck as a tiger. The second a tiger in the world can't catch its prey anymore, it dies. Ellie notices something is wrong with Diego and tells Manny to go check on him. Manny tries to get out of it by saying, guys don't talk to guys. But when Ellie pushes him to go and do it, he does it. Diego explains pretty calmly that he just wants to go on his own for a while. And as he's losing his edge as a tiger, he isn't built for chaperoning children. Again, a very valid point. He's a tiger. He, What does he know about raising a mammoth baby? But then, for some reason, Manny gets really pissy and says, what, so you don't want to be with my kid? Which is just such a fucking leaping logic, the cunt should try out for the triple jump. Diego then says, no, that is not what I've said at all. And then Manny just goes and leaves and says, sorry for being so boring. Or some shit like that. And I'm just like, what the fuck? Where is this all coming from? It's the first 12 minutes. There was nothing beforehand to show tension building. This just comes out of nowhere. Never in my life have I ever seen a lazier forced breakup occur. And then to top it all off, 
Manny then smugly says to Ellie, this is why guys don't talk to other guys. You twat, you didn't speak to him. You asked him what is wrong after being forced to by your wife. Then Diego told you what is wrong and you somehow made it about yourself. And then when Ellie asks quite rightly what happened, Manny just goes, Diego's leaving without elaborating at all. This scene is so fucking stupid. It annoys me, but... Let's carry on. So Sid, now feeling a bit abandoned by everyone, finds these dino eggs and decides to raise them as his own. When they hatch, they all imprint on Sid and he decides to take care of them. He then lets them into Manny's um, homemade playground that he'd made especially for his own children and had specifically said, don't let any other kids into it. But when all the other kids see that Sid has opened it for his kids, they then enter and destroy it all, which basically makes Manny very angry. The mother to the babies tries to come and find them, finds them, and then takes Sid with her, causing Ellie and Manny to go after them. Ellie in this film is so much better than in the second. She just doesn't put up with any of Manny's shit, and I respect it, as he's insufferable in this film. To further this point, the gang discovers the hidden dinosaur world under the ice and head off to try and find Sid. Diego appears to try and help find them, to which Manny just sarcastically has a go at him for no fucking reason. Manny says, what are you doing down here? And then Diego goes, trying to find Sid, the same as you, to which Manny responds, well, aren't you noble? What the fuck is wrong with you? He's trying to help you. Then later on, where they're surrounded by dinosaurs and eventually get saved by Buck, this weasel who's lived in the dinosaur world his entire life, he says that Sid is probably dead after a dinosaur had taken him. Ellie then says, well, we still want to try and look for him. To which Manny chimes in with, maybe Buck has a point. Like, like I know before I was harping on about like missing when Manny was a dick, but he's just become unrecognizable. Let's say hypothetically, Ellie just minusly agrees with Manny and they leave the dinosaur world. Manny would have left one of his best friends to die without ever knowing if he's truly dead or not. Like, it's just so out of character. So anyway, Buck, is he a good character? Yes. Is he good enough for a spin-off 13 years later? Absolutely fucking not. He's charismatic and he delivers his lines well, but he's a little too overly cartoonish at times and can come off as quite annoying. Through the jungle of misery, across the chasm of death, to the plates of woe. Whoa. I was about to make a joke that they stole this from Kung Fu Panda 2, but this came out three years before, which means Kung Fu Panda may have stole this joke from them. And the thought of that makes me really, really fucking sad. So back to the plot, Buck leads them through like these dangerous jungles and this laughing gas cavern. Whilst in the B plot, there's an actually really entertaining section of Sid and the mother T-Rex both competing for the children's affection. And I prefer this so much more than the actual plot. Yeah, but if I had been a better friend to him, we wouldn't be here. Better friend? Are you plucking my whiskers? You risked your life, your mate, and your baby to save your buddy. A darn good friend. Yeah, so are they going to show the 50 or so clips of Manny wanting to actively abandon this mission? Or are we just going to ignore... Yep, we're ignoring it? Okay. Also, with the introduction of Buck, this film is getting really comfy with these cutaway segments. And I hate it. This isn't Family Guy. Stop it. What's that sound? It's the wind. It's speaking to us. What's it saying? I don't know. I don't speak wind. I'm so happy this film can get some form of smile out of me, though. So the climax of the film comes about as Buck, Crash, and Eddie go to save Sid, who's been cornered by Rudy. And I realise I haven't mentioned who Rudy is, so it's it's a dinosaur that who is Buck's mortal enemy because Buck took his tooth and Rudy took his eye and they're constantly fighting. Okay. Why this dinosaur three fucking times the size of a T-Rex deciding its main meal that it's going to pursue is going to be a sloth literally smaller than one of its toes? I have no idea. Whilst on the other end, Ellie is giving birth whilst the group must protect her from these raptor fuckers who are after her. So Rudy never actually shows up at this point as he's made Sid fall into this lava fall. But Crash and Eddie save him and Ellie successfully has a baby which they call Peaches. And there's still half an hour left of this film, so... There he is. Okay. To be fair, his design is really cool. I do quite like it. 
So they all work together to fight Rudy, even the mother T-Rex comes to help, and they end up defeating him. Sid says goodbye to the T-Rex and her children, and this film also sets up an interesting dynamic that I found myself really liking. Buck had been in this world so long that his only purpose became fighting Rudy, developing a love-hate relationship with him. Throughout the entire film, whenever Buck is even speaking of him, he's grinning ear to ear. So when Rudy gets defeated and supposedly dies, Buck has no idea what to do with himself. The group offer him to come back to the surface with them and he accepts. But then just as he's about to leave, he hears Rudy's cry, showing that he's still alive and decides to go back to face him once again. I don't know, it's an interesting ending and, you know, an actual good reason for why Buck won't be in the later films. So that was Ice Age 3 Dawn of the Dinosaurs. Uh, this film was just a whole lot of nothing. But was it worse than the second film? I think that's purely up for debate. The start is very jarring and goes on for way too long. The rest is definitely not bad. Buck was certainly entertaining when he wanted to be and there were definitely little parts of the movies that I liked. The tone of this film is completely different as well, which I'm starting to notice more and more as we go through this series. The first film was more grounded in realism with a lot of somber moments and most of its comedy either came from slapstick or funny character interactions. The second film was a lot more cartoony and flanderized with its jokes coming from a lot of either pop culture references or cartoony weird scenarios or toilet humor. The whole film never once took itself seriously, even in high stakes moments. You really think I'm going to be scared that they're going to get eaten by Gimbo and Trimbo over here when 30 minutes ago they were balancing on 30 different shaped rocks that were constantly spinning across a bottomless chasm as they were all arguing about Manny inadvertently hitting on Ellie? Like, no. Whilst in this film, again, it has its own style, even more fanderized than the second to be sure, but it's not reached that insulting point yet. It's just enough that I can bear it. Manny is really weird in this film. We've seen more than enough material to know that Sid gets on his nerves, but he really considers letting Sid die in this film, and it just feels so out of character. Diego is still as solid as ever. He really seems to be the cornerstone of this series, honestly. Sid is showing terminal signs of flanderization, but he still has some funny moments, so I'll give him a pass. Ellie was really good in this film. They really turned a character around from the first one, and I really like it. So I'll give this film a 4 or 5 out of 10. Pretty average. Okay, on to the fourth film. Fuck me. So this one was one of my favorites growing up, and from my past experiences now, I know just not to anticipate these films and just take them for what they are. So this film starts out many years in the future with Peaches, Manny's daughter, being a teenager. And now, if you'll let me, because I know I haven't done one of these in a while, a rant, if you will. Not specifically about this film, but about a trope that I just don't like in films, especially in franchises, and that's the angsty teenager trope. Like, in the third film, Peaches was just fucking born. And now, you've gone almost two decades into the future, purely for the ability to create conflict. Because she's an angsty teenager, and of course there's going to be conflict. And it sounds really nitpicky, and you know what? Yeah, it probably is. You can discard this point if you want. But it just, I don't know, it just annoys me. So Sid's family appears out of nowhere, that they're only ever talked about in the first film. And they're exactly what you'd expect. They're cunts, really. They come to see Sid and pretend that they've come to see him to like drop in and say hello. But what they've actually done is to ditch the grandma, who is again, a purely comic relief character with no depth or really any character whatsoever. I, I don't think there's any characters in this series who are like that. I'm so glad they added one. All while this is happening, Peaches is trying to sneak off with her friend Lewis to go to this spot to meet boy mammoths also way to date this film fucking horrifically 10 10 minutes in do i look okay lewis okay doesn't even begin to cover it oh lewis you're the greatest friend ever. Lewis is such a shit character. Oh my god. Lewis is such a shit character. His entire character is that he's a huge pussy and an r slash nice guy. That's all he is. He has no personality other than that. He has no personality other than he likes Ellie and sighs every time she can't realize it. So Peaches ends up going to this spot and meeting the guy she has a crush on until Manny comes in and goes off at her in front of everyone because he specifically told her not to go there, embarrassing her in front of everyone. Peaches then starts arguing with him because he's embarrassed her in front of everyone, which to be fair, 
yeah, I feel like she has every right to. Like, Manny's becoming really quickly insufferable throughout these films. He's gone from a level-headed, sarcastic, and quick-to-anger character to just a fucking idiot who can't possess basic common sense. How could he think that going down to Peaches and scolding her in front of everyone would be a good idea? And it'd make it slightly better if in this film they actually acknowledged the first film, something I don't think any of these sequels have actually done, and tried to relate all this to the fact that Manny's previous family were killed. And maybe that's why he's so protected, but they never do. To protect you! That's what fathers do! Well, I wish you weren't my father. Oh, fuck off. Really? That's the big split up thing. Come on, movie. You do better than that. So then, as the film's named, the continental drift starts to happen, and Manny, Diego, and Sid are separated from the group on a big iceberg, while the other characters try and make it to the larger land bridge before the ground beneath them collapses. More cartoony shit happens with the main cast, and they finally settle into their new circumstances. It's revealed that Granny is also on board with them, which is just, it's so great. So whilst nothing else is happening, let's talk about the characters in this one. Yeah, they're all pretty much as flanderized as they're gonna get. Sid is now just an idiot. He's just a full-blown, brain-dead idiot who is used for jokes about how stupid he is and how unaware he is. Diego still is alright, but he he's slowly losing his personality. Like I said before, Manny is an idiot. Ellie is surprisingly a really good character. Like they've she's been on a consistent like rise throughout these films. Peaches is bland, Lewis is terrible, and the rest are just bad so far. And now we get onto the main villains of the film, the first set of villains since the first film to in fact have functioning brains. How about that? Yeah, they're all right. Definitely better than the tiger pack at least. The only issue being that there's way too many of them. Like I don't think most of them are even named. They're just characters who say lines and that's it. The captain's actually quite entertaining. He's not just evil because he's some savage animal like every villain in the series. He's one dimensional, don't get me wrong, but he's also quite charming. He's also animated well and you know, fucking, it's a cool concept. See, he's a pirate, he's a monkey, I like it. They sing a sea shanty and the crew reveals that Captain Gut saved them all at some point in his life, so there's that as well. But then when the gang escape and break the ship in half, Gut leaves Shira, the white tiger, and his first mate alone to die, so I don't know how affectionate the captain really is. The gang, of course, save Shira. We then see Peach is back on land speaking to that boy she likes, who for some reason just hates Lewis. Like, he doesn't explain why he does, he just doesn't want him to be there. It's, it's so, it's so fucking lazy. It's just another conflict starter between Peaches and Lewis, and they're not even trying to hide it anymore. To make it better though, there's a scene of Granny beating the shit out of Scrap, which actually made me laugh out loud. <laughs> So they finally reach land and realise that Gut is also at the same island. This island also happens to have the right current to take them home again. They realise that Gut is using these little rodent things as slaves for his ship, so the gang decide to recruit the remaining ones left to fight back against him. Yep, they are as annoying as you think they are. Shira and Diego have a pretty natural conversation together that's really well done. Like, I don't know why. It's like I expect so little from this film that even a conversation that happens to be done right is seen as a blessing. It's filled with a lot of banter and with them getting to know each other better, but it isn't filled with those shit cliches of, like, subtly flirting with each other or them looking away all flustered or whatever the fuck. Like, I don't know. It's, it's cool. It's natural. It's good. Shira then escapes her prison and then warns Gut about the gang coming, in which Gut has a very weird response. Like, he tells her that she should have killed them all, and that she's a failure for not doing that. When it's like... It's like, how? The gang tries to steal the ship and succeeds. Diego tries to get Shira to come with him, but she stays behind in order to stop Gut. Gut, out of rage, pulls two building-sized pieces of ice apart and makes a new ship. Fuck me, okay. Back on land, Peaches tells the boy she likes that she's not friends with Lewis. He hears her and gets upset. Peaches realizes what she's done is wrong and decides to stop hanging out with them. I'm not dead! And why did a hurricane have an eye but not an ear? Uh, and I'll push him overboard. You guys say it was an accident. And why do males have nipples? I'm in. To be fair, this part made me smile. Can't eat, can't sleep. Maybe I'm coming down with something. <laughs> oh, I know what you've got. The L word. Yeah, leprosy. Okay, 
What the fuck? <laughs> that was really funny. Jesus Christ, this boat scene is it's two for two at the moment. Oh, and I remember this part. This part used to freak me the fuck out when I was younger. It basically has these, like, siren people who hypnotize people by disguising themselves with other people and like, lure them close. Manny finds out they're sirens when the one pretending to be Ellie says that he's always right, and in real life, Ellie would never say that. Which, again, is really quite funny. I don't, this boat is doing them wonders. Oh, it was this. This scene freaked me out so much. It's just the way her pupils shrink. It, oh, it's terrifying. It genuinely gave me nightmares for weeks. So they escaped the sirens and make it back to land where Guts had gotten to them first and captured Manny's family. And all the other people. Just, just one question. How the fuck have they done that? Like, they show all the people they have detained, but like, did none of them fight back? There's like 30 of them and like 6 pirates. 3 of whom are smaller than most of these mammals' feet. How the fuck did they get overpowered? So anyway... Lewis ends up being the catalyst who sets everyone to fight back, which is so dumb. I I hate Lewis. They fight back, and it's pretty good, all things considered. Like, the, the final climax fight between uh, Captain Guts and Manny is actually really good. And though it's cartoony, I, I just like it. Obviously, Manny beats him, and the day is saved. Well, someone once told me, no matter what, you never leave a friend behind. I actually want to shoot this fucker in his face. Oh, my God. God, why did that meme of the Ice Age baby ever exist when this guy is in the films? So they sail to a new island where they live happily ever after because the old one got destroyed. Hey, okay if we hang with you guys? Sure. What? Why? What the fuck? Kids, remember, if you ever get bullied by someone and then you change and become cool and they want to be nice to you and be your friend, just randomly out of nowhere, you should definitely be friends with your bullies. Remember that. So that's Ice Age 4, Continental Drift. Oh, oh, fuck off. Did Drake really play the jock mammoth? How did I not notice that? So, as I was saying, that was Ice Age 4. It was weird. Again, like the third Ice Age film, there were definitely parts I liked. It just wasn't consistent. Taking it purely at face value without nitpicking, the main gang's plot is actually quite good. The villains are semi-entertaining. The interactions between everyone were weirdly good. Like, I thought going into this that the granny would get on my nerves after a while, but she didn't. And the way she develops with the rest of the gang is actually quite good, even if she gets no character development. I've already mentioned the rest of the gang... They're alright. Shira is a pretty good character on her own and a good counterweight to Diego. The issue comes with the B plot. Like I said before, Peaches and Lewis are not good characters. They're stereotypes, if anything, of the nice guy and the angsty teenager who disobeys their parents. Ellie is a good character. I like her. Like, she's a good mother to Peaches and overall a good leader when it comes to leading all the other animals from the continental drift. Oh my fucking god, Peter Dinklage's voice is Captain Gut? He, no, he is my favourite character. How did I not know that? So that was Ice Age 4 Continental Drift. We're almost at the end, just one more. And something tells me this is gonna be the worst one because I cannot remember a single detail about it. So, so the film starts out, this is gonna be the last time I ever say that in this video. That's quite sad actually. Anyway, uh, let's make the most of it. So the film starts out with Manny and Peaches playing ice hockey together. We were introduced to Peaches' new boyfriend, and he's surprisingly a good character. He's called Julian. Like, he's slightly annoying, but he at least has a personality. He's bubbly and excitable, just like Peaches is, even though he gives away a few too many pop culture references that I like. Also, Sid just looks disgusting in this movie. The animator seems to think that because the animation quality has risen, that also means they also need to make Sid extra like rtx 3080 like fucking graphics you don't sid is disgusting already don't add more details to him they're also way overdoing cartoony movements something you'll see a lot further into the film as well like jesus christ it's like a fucking 1930s rubber hose animation and also like at some points it just doesn't even fit the characters like sometimes sid will be pulling these faces and he doesn't even look like himself and if i'm going to continue with this sid hate train it's so clear that pretty much everyone involved in this series, but especially John Leguizamo, they've just given up. And who the fuck can blame them, honestly, at this point? It doesn't sound like he's trying. And there's just there's these weird points in the film 
where it just feels like parts are missing. It's so strange. If you're wondering why he's so upset, by the way, as well, it's because his girlfriend, who we'd never seen before, breaks up with him and he proceeds to never shut up about it. Okay, first complaint coming, but it comes a lot uh, later than expected, so I guess that's a plus. So, it's Manny's and Ellie's uh, anniversary and she throws a massive celebration, but it turns out Manny forgot. Now, it turns out that some asteroids exploding in the atmosphere make firework display for Ellie and this coincidence ends up saving his ass as everyone just thinks he planned the fireworks. You're telling me the character that four times a month when his wife was pregnant would do emergency false alarm pregnancy chest just so he could be prepared for the real one and the character who followed and then berated his daughter in front of her in order to keep her safe from like weird mammoths and the fucker who traveled halfway across the sea to find his family again after he lost them and the guy who is still incredibly overprotective of his daughter having a boyfriend even though he has proven time and time again that he's great and a trustworthy guy as well as a bunch of other things over the series he forgot his wife's anniversary and we're also not going to discuss how in this world they somehow know what fireworks are it just we're not even getting into that on the plus side there's a cute side plot of diego and shira wanting kids of their own and not understanding why other kids won't go near them even though it makes no sense and it's completely out of character for them it's quite it's still nice so the comments that cause the fireworks eventually start breaking through the atmosphere and attack our main cast so they must run for cover it then cuts to these dinosaurs who <sighs> fucking hell i don't know i don't know man they're these dinosaur bird things that steal eggs to eat but buck gets them back for the mother dinosaurs oh yeah and these dinosaurs speak basically throwing the cannon that no dinosaur can speak in this film out of the window brilliant buck then after falling down a hole finds a prophecy and tries to find our main cast to warn them Oh yeah, if you didn't already guess, Buck is returning in this film. And they've ruined him as well. <laughs> it's just like they've completely forgotten what made him so good in the first place. Now he's even more cartoony than before, just spitting even more pop culture references than before. And there's just so many things he does in this film that you can tell they only put in because he does something similar in the third film. The prophecy that Buck finds reads that a meteor will hit the same place every 10 million years or something and kill all life on Earth. So in order to stop it, Buck suggests that they go to a place where it hits all the time in order to figure out why it does that and then stop it. Which both Manny and Sid's grandma both think is a stupid decision. Which just... What? Does this film think that babies are watching it or something they can't process the basic understanding that a comet can kill them no matter where they are in the world manny even goes wait 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 so you're telling me instead of running away from the asteroid we need to go towards it like yes that is exactly what you've got to do. He says it as if like little amoebas and little single-celled organisms who can't even process thoughts are watching it. I don't know what to believe. I'm afraid our lives will be over before they begin. Uh, shut the fuck up, Peaches. <laughs> what the fuck? What was that delivery? Oh, fucking hell, these lot are back. So far, every Ice Age villain hasn't actually been that bad. But these lot are just insulting. One of the main characteristics of every villain in this series is they're either much bigger than our heroes or much more dangerous. These lot are neither. Second, their motivation is is really dumb like diego's original pack's motivation was to kill the human baby because said human killed most of his tribe very simple good motivation mimbo and fimbo have only motivation for food because they're minus dinosaurs same with rudy captain gut's motivation is to control the ocean which then develops into getting revenge on our heroes when they wrong him notice how there is a good amount of fuel behind each of these fires whilst with what are they called again? Gavin, Gertie, and Roger. So, Gavin, Gertie, and Roger's master plan for this film is that they will let the asteroid hit the Earth and then fly over the explosion, surviving and becoming kings of the world. No. No. No, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I'm not joking. That is the genuine plot and motivation of basically the main villain because there's no other villains in this film the main villain of this film that is their motivation let me just let's just come come on let's just sit down let's just all sit down if you're standing i don't care if you're on the train or something sit down sit down on the on the floor right let me tell you something very important when it comes to villains and their plans they need to make 
fucking sense. This plant is the epitome of, oh yeah, if a nuke went off near me, I just wouldn't die. But that's just me though. Obviously, this plan wouldn't work. Even Roger, the youngest son, calls his dad out telling him how stupid he is. They also fail to mention how Earth would ever have food or water on it if the asteroid destroyed it. And it's just like, why should I care? Why should I care about anything in this film if the main villain's plot doesn't actually make sense? Speaking of Roger, I fucking hate him. He is the epitome of, well, actually, according to the scientific theorem of mathematics, this plan can't actually have a possibility of working. Oh, I hate it. I hate that I hate that character trope. Speaking of stereotypes, Peaches is still one. Like, I made fun of the delivery earlier, but that now seems to be her whole character. Just saying, like, what if, what if we don't make it? It's like, oh, Jesus Christ, it's so annoying. Anyway, back to the plot. Well, I say that, but nothing much has happened. Buck ends up sending the gang down a different path after seeing the dino freaks coming to kill them. But like, why? There's three of them and 11 of our main characters. Why is Buck so scared of them? Which brings me on to my next point about this film. And that's the fact there's way too many characters. The original film had three characters that all worked well, all bounced off together, telling jokes and overall creating a really good dynamic. The second film introduced three more characters to the roster, giving us now six main characters. The third film introduced a seventh temporary main character, and I think personally this is where you need to stop. This is where you have to stop with ki with main characters. Kids movies like Toy Stories have shown they can have multiple main characters and work completely, but that's only if the movie's plot has been crafted in the right way. Ice Age doesn't even know what its story is half the time, so how can they delegate that time to each character? When we move into the fourth film, we're introduced to four more main characters, bringing the total up to 11 main characters, and then with this film, with the reintroduction of Buck and the subtraction of Lewis and the adding of Julian, the main character total is 12. 12 fucking main characters the movie needs time to delegate towards that's just not possible why isn't it possible it's just not why not you stupid bastard and that's not even mentioning the side characters in which there are fucking thousands and the main villains this franchise just loves adding surplus characters when they can barely give enough time to the ones they already have and just a side note Lewis is completely gone from this film, and I'm assuming the franchise if they ever decide to make another one. Like, he never comes back, and we never know why. Even the Wikipedia page says he, it's unknown why he left the herd. So, the group find the big asteroid that is still on Earth, which is what is attracting the other asteroid in space, and they go inside to find a whole civilization living in it. They then go to meet the leader of the civilization to warn him about the asteroid. I just want you to watch this clip, please. <laughs> Greetings, mammals. The Shangri Lama will see you now. What the fuck is actually happening anymore? I'm losing my goddamn mind. I don't even know what to call him. He's a leader? And he is one of, no, correct, the most annoying, unfunny, strangest characters in this series by far i am genuinely i am serious i am i i know i say this a lot i am speechless i have no words to describe how fucking annoying this character actually is his entire character is that he's like a guru or something and that he does yoga but pretty much all of his yoga moves are so the animators can show off his ass because haha funny ass ass is funny laugh he also doesn't help our characters in the slightest either. Nor does he tell our characters why he can't help them. He just doesn't. And then proceeds to show his ass again to the camera. Like, that's his character. So anyway, Sid and this woman sloth in here. Oh yeah, there's a woman sloth who likes Sid for no real reason. Like, I just, I hate that as well. Why can't they give someone a solid reason for being in love with Sid? Like, he's shown time and time again that he is very stupid, he's very unhygienic, but he's not completely irredeemable. He has actual good qualities about them, so why can't this movie just highlight them instead of inventing a character that just falls for him immediately and never reveals why? So yeah, Sid and the sloth woman decide to get married, and Sid removes one of the crystals from the um, asteroid in order to propose. 
This then causes the entire asteroid to collapse for some fucking reason. And then everyone starts to age because these crystals actually made them immortal. So why does it stop? Like, Sid doesn't destroy all of them. There are plenty still around. It's just the ceiling that came off. So why does that change anything? Again, this film is filled with so many plot holes, it's ridiculous. Then, and fucking... This prick of a llama starts having a go at Sid, calling him an idiot, as if it's common knowledge that removing a small chunk of a crystal would collapse an entire asteroid. Like, the fuck? You didn't tell him. No one told him you can't touch the crystal. And not like we, the audience, would know. It, just, it feels so forced. And again, the character is so annoying. You just want to punch his face in. He's now gone from just ass jokes to just screaming like a lunatic, but not even a comedic way. And then when the gang realizes they can use the volcano to launch the crystals into space, saving everyone, the llama still tries to stop them for no reason. This film has already established the fact that they were destroyed. It means there's no more immortality. So then why is he keeping them if there's no value to them? It's like they don't even remember things they've established three seconds ago. So then something happens and Roger is able to get his family's approval or something. And then... Um, and then they fail to bring the big rock up to the hill to stop the asteroid. Oh yeah, there's a big rock they need to bring up to the asteroid, by the way. And so Manny and Julian need to work together in order to stop it. Fuck me. You know what? No, you know what pisses me off as well. The movie makers definitely thought this was so smart. They definitely thought this climax was so big brain. They definitely thought that bringing the two characters that don't see eye to eye, I don't even think I mentioned it, but basically Manny and Julian don't see eye to eye, and now they have to work together, and it's so smart, and it, oh, it just annoys me. So a bunch of stuff happens at the end, but I'll just bullet point it because we're, we're, we're so close. So, Peaches and Julian gets married. Sid and the woman he loves stays together. Diego and Shira finally learn how to be good with kids, and that's the end. And a couple of other stuff happened, but I can't be asked to mention it. Okay. This film was by far the worst one. It's not even close. The constant plot holes, annoying characters, strange animation choices, awful plots in general, terrible, unthreatening villains, getting rid of every previously established character for no reason, making a lot of characters do completely out of character things, having too many characters and then being unable to give them all proper time, giving characters motivation that on a basic level makes no sense, flanderizing characters to the point of insulting, not giving characters who are actually good any screen time, using character tropes that worked well in previous films but don't work well here, too many pop culture references, and overall just being lazy. This film is by far the worst Ice Age film and perhaps one of the worst children's films I have ever seen. And that's it. I've done it. I've reviewed in depth every single Ice Age film. This for the past week has been a routine for me. Just watching the films and writing this script and at the same time, but it's all done now. Uh, which way am I, am I going? Hello? Yep. Here is my tier list for every Ice Age film, and I hope you all enjoyed. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one. <sighs> bye bye That's all, folks.